morning, King's House. How are we doing today? Anybody excited to be in church this morning on a Labor Day weekend? Hey, look at your neighbor and say, I'm so happy to see you this morning. Seriously, guys, so blessed to have you. We got a lot of people traveling, coming back from football games and on vacations, but I'm so blessed and, and happy to have you today. I think God has something very special in store for us today. First of all, I just want to commend you guys. Like, this week you signed up for the men's conference. Thank you so much. It makes my heart beat just a little bit easier. And I want to challenge you ladies, like if you're thinking about it, it's two weeks from yesterday. If you're thinking about coming to the women's conference, it's going to be incredible. Yes, you're going you're to have a great time. You're going to build relationships, but you're also going to meet with God in some very profound ways. So I just can't encourage you enough, guys. Sign up for those conferences. It's going to be a beautiful thing. And next Sunday is going to be one of the most beautiful of all things. And I just want to, one more time, reiterate Next Sunday, we're taking our special offering, but at 6.30 that night at 524 West Osage, we are having our official groundbreaking service for the community of hope. It's going to be incredible. It is. It is just going to be incredible. So I'll send out a video this week with some more details. We're going to park out there. If you don't want to park out there, we'll probably run a, a bus back and forth from here, but we'll, we'll get all that figured out. But whatever your plans are, just go ahead and scrap those plans because you need to be at the groundbreaking service at 630 next week, right? And all God's people said. Finishing up part three of this series today called Dangerous Prayers. And as you analyze your prayer life, I just want to ask you this question just for you to kind of take a look inward. How many of your prayers revolve around you, your family, or people that you love and are close to you? You don't have to answer. I'm just, just to, you can. I like when you talk to me. I preach so much better when you talk to me. Yeah. But how many of your prayers revolve around you or your family or the people that are closest to you? And they, I mean, God bless us, provide for us, protect us, do this, do that. And, and listen, I, I, those are wonderful prayers, and you need to pray for yourself. Some of you might need to pray a little harder for yourself. Yeah, yeah. And you need to pray for your family. I mean, all those things are relevant, and God wants to bless you and provide for you and protect. Like, all that's true. Don't stop doing that. That's not what I'm saying this morning. But what I'm saying is I think God wants to start shifting that mindset just a little bit. At JFK's inaugural speech, he said these words. I know you've all heard them before, but it's very profound. He said, don't ask what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And I think that's the same mindset that we are in desperate need of in the church today all across the world. We get so wrapped up and consumed with what God can do for me. And there are some incredible perks that go along with being a child of God, right? Right? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that they're not, but that's our whole mindset of what God can do for me. And I believe he wants to shift that to this mindset. God, what can I do for you? That's the mindset that he wants us to have. Like, God, I am your servant. I'm available. What do you want me to do for you? This can be very dangerous, this mindset. It can be very costly. It can be very uncomfortable, but it's also so glorious, the fruit that comes out of it. It forces us to get out of our comfort zones where we don't really grow, right? If you're staying where you've been for the last 20 years and you're not growing and God wants you to move, he's got new things for you and new things he wants you to step into, but that might require you stepping out of the boat just a little bit, getting out of your comfort zone, and that can look like so many different things for so many different people. Maybe he's telling you to go back to school. Well, I'm 50 years old, God. I don't want to go back to school, but I'm, you've asked, like, God, what can I do for you? And he says, I need you to go back to school. Maybe he's going to ask you to do something very uncomfortable, leave a career that you've been in for years, start a new job. He might need you somewhere else. Maybe your step is just like, man, I really need to join a home group. I really need to sign up for a men's conference. It, it can be all sorts of different things, but he's calling us to, to, to take those steps to, to step out of the boat, do things that maybe we've never done before. And we can see all through God's scripture where he calls people to take a step to go and do things. Now listen, Jesus is not going to call you on the telephone tomorrow morning. Can I get a witness? Wouldn't it be wonderful if he did? I mean, seriously, like 7 a.m., Jesus, every morning, hit me up. Tell me what to do. Maybe more importantly, tell me what not to do. Come on. 
That would be, but that's, he's not going to do that. But he is going to speak to you. He is going to, he is going to nudge you. He, 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 he is going to try to push you out to, to go here, to do this, to say this, to pray this. And I, I just want to look at several responses in the word of God. When God calls people, some of those different responses. And in that, we're going to find our very dangerous prayer that we're going to pray today. The first response I want to show you when God calls somebody is this response. God, here I am. I'm not going. <laughs> Like, nope, not, sorry, I'm right here. Yeah, negative, Ghost Rider, not going. We, we see this in the life of Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, look, look at this response that Jonah has. Now, remember that this is the creator of the universe, God Almighty, speaking to Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its, wicked, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah, nope, he, he, he ran away from the Lord and headed toward Tarshish. Now, when we read this story, like, it's, it's hard to comprehend that kind of blatant disobedience to God, isn't it? I mean, God tells you to do something, you're just straight up, no, I'm, I'm not going. However, I think if we were to be honest with ourselves, which I talked a few weeks ago is, is difficult to do. We are professional liars to ourselves, aren't we? All sorts of excuses. But if we were to be honest to ourselves, those words may never come out of our mouth, God, no. But with our actions and with our responses, we tell God no all the time. By a show of hands, let's just be open and honest and vulnerable in the room this morning. By a show of hands, have you ever felt like you were supposed to invite somebody to church and you just couldn't muster up the nerve to do it and so you didn't? Anybody? Yes, come on, thank you for your honesty. Have you ever felt like, man, I just need to tell that person that Jesus loves them or share my testimony with them or just give them some sort of, of the gospel and I, I just knew I was supposed to share it with that person but I just couldn't muster up the nerve to do it. Anybody in the room done that? The rest of you are probably liars. God's asked everybody to do that at some point in time. <laughs> Several years ago, I, I used to travel to the Middle East every single year, and I would preach at different churches, but I had the opportunity to do, speak for a week at a time at a Muslim school, 90% Muslim, 2,000 kids in the school, 90% of them were Muslim. Just an incredible opportunity. One particular day, I, I was speaking hundreds of kids in their auditorium, and there was this one particular girl that just, she stood out to me in the crowd. Like, if, if, it's hard to describe if you've never been up here preaching, but sometimes people just jump out at you in the crowd, and you just know that God has something for them. So, man, this girl just really jumped out at me. Later that day, like, I knew the Lord asked me to give this girl a Bible. I knew that, and just tell her that Jesus loves her, that Jesus has a plan for her life, but this girl's a Muslim. And if you're wondering how many redheads exist in the Middle East, the answer is none. I was the only one. I stood out like a sore thumb. I'm trying to be low key, flying under the radar. So I, I disobeyed. Like I knew what God wanted and just, uh, I just tried to ignore that, right? Uh, a couple days go by, and uh, man, the Holy Spirit is still just dealing with me. Like, you got to tell that girl, you got to, you got to, you got to, you got to. Finally, two or three days in, like, fine, Lord. I see her in the school. I walk up to her. I said, listen. I, this is going to sound weird, but I feel like God told me to, to just to give you this Bible and let you know he loves you. And he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And it was every bit as awkward as you can imagine it would be. It was. It was not well received. There was no tears or goosebumps. It was awkward. And she just kind of awkwardly goes on her way. But, hey, I obeyed God. I did it. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. The next morning I walk into the school and this girl, whose name is Nora, she comes rushing up to me. She is, I mean, tears streaming down her face. She is visibly shaken. Something has happened to this girl. I said, Nora, is everything okay? She said, Mark, I took that Bible home and I put it on my nightstand and I didn't even think about it and I went to bed. In the middle of the night, I had a dream. In my dream, I saw these giant words that said, John 15, 16. I didn't know what John 15, 16 was, but something told me, like, that's probably a scripture in the Bible. In the middle of the night, she opens up her Bible. She searches. She finds John 15, 16, and the verse says this, you didn't choose me, but I chose you, and I have appointed you to bear lasting fruit, and anything you ask in my name will be given to you. She said, Mark, Jesus really is real, isn't he? 
Oh, he's so real, sweetheart. He really loves me and has a plan for my life. Absolutely, he does. And right there in the middle of a gymnasium in Lebanon, the Middle East, that little Muslim girl invited Jesus into her heart. Come on, King's House. How many opportunities... Do we miss all the time because we talk ourselves out of it? We're so great at it. We know what God wants us to do. Just like, here's a great excuse that we use. Well, I'm just, I'm not sure, Pastor Mark. I'm, I'm still learning to hear God's voice, and I'm just having a hard time distinguishing, like, is that God's voice or is that the enemy's voice? To clear up any confusion that there might be this morning, the devil is not telling you to invite people to church, friends. That's the Lord speaking, okay? Don't buy into that lie. God has people that he wants you to meet, people that he wants you to impact. you got to say, God, here I am. Yeah, you can't say, I'm not going. Here's the next response, the second response. We see this a lot. Here I am, Lord. Send somebody else. I'm right here, but yeah, send somebody else. Exodus chapter 3, the Lord's calling Moses to go back to Egypt to deliver the Israelites. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Like, God, I appreciate the offer, but you got the wrong dude. Send my brother Aaron. He's much more qualified. He's much more well-spoken. And we as believers are so great at doing this, passing the buck off to somebody. Go. Like, you want me to go? You preaching to me, Pastor Mark? Oh, God, listen, you, you know my schedule. You, you know, man, I got practices and I got games. God, you know I can't go. I'll tell you who can go. Josh Timmons, that guy, that's who needs to go. Give? Are you kidding? God, you've seen my budget? You want me to give? I can't afford it. I, I tell you who can give. Uh, Gavin Guthrie can give. That's who we need to, we're so great at it. Like, we love when, when people serve our children, but serve? Like, I'm not exactly called the kids' ministry, Lord. You want me to serve? We have all these lists of reasons. I'll tell you who can serve. we got to break out of this mindset to say, you got the wrong guy. Send somebody else. In Isaiah chapter 6, we see the response that I believe that God is looking for from each and every one of us in the story of Isaiah. Starting in verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send And who will go for us? And I said, here am I, Lord. Send me. This is the dangerous prayer that I want to challenge each of you to pray this week, to take to heart. God, if you're looking for somebody to send, God, you can send me. I'm not perfect. I don't have it all figured out. But, God, I am available. Come on, King's House. I'm ready to go. I want to point out to you. Isaiah didn't even ask where he was going. He didn't ask about the climate or the compensation or the housing market or the benefit packages. Does that include insurance and a 401K, God? He never asked. He said, God, I'm here. I'm available. If you're looking for somebody to send, God, send me. Use me. This should be the heart cry of every single believer as he brings us to this place of trust and complete surrender. We love referring to Jesus as our father. We love him as a, as a friend. We love him as a helper and as a savior. And Jesus is all of those things. But he's also your Lord. And he is your master. And you are his servant. And you don't get an opinion in the situation. When God says go, your job is to to go. And if he tells you to speak, you speak. And if he tells you to shut up, you keep your mouth shut. God, everything you need, anything, God, I'm available. Lord, send me. That's the response he's looking for from every believer that's in this room this morning. Why is it so difficult for us? Why do so few Christians live their life like this? This should be the normal. This shouldn't be the the exception to the rule. I want to show you just a few passages in in Isaiah chapter 6. How did Isaiah get to this point where he's willing to say, God, yes, hear my man, send me. Here's the first thing I think you need if you're going to come to this place of complete surrender in your life. The first thing you need is a genuine experience with God's presence. 
a genuine experience with God's presence. Isaiah 6, 1 says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now think about Isaiah for a second. He's seeing all this. This isn't some storybook time. This is something real that he's experiencing. I saw the Lord high and exalted. I saw the Lord seated on his throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Man, this is a life-changing encounter with the presence of God when he really sees Jesus. And to come to this place of complete surrender, man, Man, we need these moments with God. Surrender to Jesus comes so much easier after you've had a life-changing encounter with him. It does. It, it becomes so much easier. Listen, I, I, this, I don't want to rock your boat this morning. All, all my friends who, who aren't Pentecostal and charismatic, I had a very bizarre experience when I was 16 years old. Theologically, I cannot explain it to you, so don't ask me to try. Okay? I can't show it to you in the Word. But here's what I do know is that I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. Let's try that again. <laughs> I'm not a wackadoodle. I'm not some sensationalized spiritual guru. I'm not. Like, I'm a very grounded, level-headed dude who just loves Jesus. But when I was 16, man, the Lord had been working on my heart. Man, I had experienced his love, oh, in such an incredible way. And for the first time in my life, I, I realized, like, that's something that I could spend the rest of my life chasing, like, I don't care about rules and religion and everything I'd been taught up to that point. But when I experience God's love, like, I can live for that. So that had happened a few months earlier, and God was preparing me. But I'm at a youth camp. And the, the sermon was very stereotypical youth camp. Like, hey, come to the altar, surrender to God, say yes, give everything to him. And I went up front, man, just so hungry for God. Like, I want to experience you, Lord. I'm ready to surrender everything. There's a little prayer team down front. And I come down front, and, man, I'm just, I'm feeling God's presence, and I'm a, I'm a little weepy, and I'm just, Jesus, I love you, and I'm just, I'm surrendering. God, my life belongs to you. There was an individual that approached me and said, Mark, can I just pray with you real quick? Absolutely, you can pray with me real quick. Here's where things got weird. The second that man put his hand on my chest, I've never been struck by lightning. I have peed on an electric fence, so that's <laughs> probably similar. <laughs> True story. But it felt like what I would imagine being struck by lightning felt like. I mean, it's some incredible force hit me so stinking hard it felt like a Mack truck. Before I knew what happened, I was just on the ground. And, you know, growing, growing up in a charismatic, like, people falling and flopping all the time. That's every service. You know what I mean? But you always got those people, like, before they get slain in the spirit, they take a little peek to make sure someone's going to catch them. Like, oh, someone's there. Yes, Lord. Woo, glory. It wasn't that at all. There was no time to peek. There was no time to see. If, I don't know if someone caught me or not. I couldn't tell you. I got hit by a daggum Mack truck from heaven of, of some sort. I don't know if it was a dream. I don't know if it was a vision. Again, this is not theological. This is just a very real encounter I had with Jesus that changed my life. On the ground there, I see all these faces flashing in front of me. Dream-like, vision-like, all different shapes, sizes, colors. I understand that these people are from all over the world. I mean, so many different people. But they were, they, they were all desperate. They were all crying desperately pleading with me. They all said, Mark, please come help us. Please come help us. Come, come, please. I mean, I am a, I am a absolute wreck from this bizarre, crazy experience with the Lord. But I got up from the ground understanding that, like, there is a very real God who's very passionate about reaching people, and he's called me to do that in some form or fashion. Surrender got so much easier after that point. The question I want to ask you today, friends, is when was the last time you had a genuine experience with God's presence? I'm not, I'm not, I've never had an experience like that before, and I haven't had one since. That was 22 years ago. Okay, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. But when was the last time you experienced God's presence, his love? When was the last time he spoke to you? When was the last time you just knew that God was in the room and he was working on you? It should happen to you fairly frequently, church. I mean, just last week, I was out at the pavilion. Early one morning, man, I'm praying, I'm walking, I got my music, I'm reading the word. I mean, just having this great moment with Jesus. And all of a sudden, like, I just realized, like, the presence of God is with me in this moment. It was almost, I could feel it. Like, it was a holy moment. 
And I, I'm not an emotional guy, but when God shows up, man, I get all sorts of crying. I'm crying, and, and I have the greatest job in the whole world, and I love it so much. But some days it gets so heavy in the pressure and the stress and the decisions and the, ah. Uh, in that moment, like, I just feel God just lifting that baggage up off of me. And it was like, oh, I, could, I can breathe. My mind was clear. I could focus. Like, God was in that moment touching me, getting some of that junk off of me, keeping me healthy, preparing me for what he has me to do, right? I mean, a few minutes later, Josh Timmons pulls up over by the garage door. If you haven't seen his fancy garage door, you need to check it out, man. The youth room is popping right now. 100 kids in youth this Wednesday night. Come on, somebody. Incredible. And I'm over there having a little Jesus moment, and I'm crying, and Josh pulls up, and then I'm crying even more, and I'm just, God, I'm so thankful for Josh, and I'm so thankful for what you're doing in the youth group. Like, man, if I'm crying, thanking God for Josh Timmons, you got to know that Jesus is involved, right? That's not my natural response, church. But he wants to meet with you. He wants you to encounter his presence and his love. He wants to speak to you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants that. We need some genuine experiences with God. The second thing we need is a genuine awareness of your sinfulness. A genuine awareness of your sinfulness. Now listen, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. Now Isaiah's just looked up into heaven, man, and he saw Jesus exalted, high and lifted up, sitting on his throne, angels flying around, seraphim. I mean, like, he saw up into heaven this unbelievable experience. But look at Isaiah's response. When he experienced this, this is his response. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Friends, this is the only response to have when you really encounter Jesus. One of the biggest lies our society would love us to buy into today is that you're relatively good. You're pretty, pretty relatively good. No, you're not. Your heart is deceitfully wicked. You were born a sinner. Your motives are impure. You are not good. You are a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. And when you behold Jesus in his beauty and in his majesty, that is the only response. God, woe is me. I am a sinner. I am undone. I'm ruined. We got to know that when we see him for who he is, we see ourselves for who we are. We are in desperate need of Jesus. It's interesting if you look through scripture, almost every time that an angel shows up, that a pre-incarnate Christ shows up, their first words are, fear not. Why are they going to be saying, fear not? Because the people they just showed up to are freaking scared. That's why you got to say, fear not. That's the only appropriate response, though, when you see Jesus for who he is. I am a sinner. I am aware of how sinful I am. And the third thing we have to have to come to this place of complete surrender is a genuine understanding of God's grace. Isaiah 6, verse 6, he just cried out, I'm, I'm, woe is me, I'm ruined, I'm unclean, I have unclean lips, I'm from people with unclean lips. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. This should speak to every single believer in this room. The incredible reality that a lifetime full of sin a lifetime full of selfishness, a lifetime full of mistakes and bad decisions. When you say yes to Jesus, when you invite him in to your situation, one encounter with Jesus can change everything about your life this morning, church. And one incredible, gracious swipe, man, your sins are forgiven, your guilt is removed, and your past is washed away are you kidding me 
He's incredible. When you genuinely experience him, you recognize his greatness, his majesty, his beauty. In that moment, you are overwhelmed with the reality of your sins, of your frailty, of your weakness. We will never be able to comprehend it totally, but it's in those moments that we can see that yes, a God so great can absolutely love someone like me, which is uncomprehendable. He has this amazing way of taking all of our hurts, our pain, our guilt, and our shame that he already paid for. And the great exchange, the most unfair event that has ever happened in humanity is he takes all that pain and that guilt and that shame and he exchanges it for life and life more abundantly and love and joy and peace and fulfillment and satisfaction. Seriously, church, what other rational response is there to this kind of reckless love than for us to throw up our hands and say, Jesus, everything that I have belongs to you. I'm completely yours and completely available. God, if you're looking for somebody to send, look no further, sir. Send me. It's a response he's looking for from every believer in this church. Send me. What else can you say? He saved you. He redeemed you. He gave you a future, a hope. He washed away your past. He promised you eternal inheritance. What else can you say? Send me. I'm yours, man. I have a dear friend. His name's Levi. One of my youth kids years ago, and now he's just a very dear friend. I learned this incredible lesson from Levi years ago. Played drums for me for years. We had a special service one Sunday night. Special speaker was in town. At the end of the service, they put the offering plates on the stage, and we're just taking a special offering to to bless the special speaker. Levi was a newlywed. I mean, three or four months into marriage. He's broke like a joke. Come on, somebody. You, You remember those newlywed days? The dude had $10 left to his name, and his car was on empty. And he lived 30 minutes from the church down all sorts of windy dirt roads. He's going to put that $10 in, and that's how you're going to get home, right? The Lord speaks to him and says, go put that $10 in the offering plate. His response is much like, no, uh, like Jonah, straight up, nope. <laughs> that's my last $10, Lord, I'm not... God wouldn't leave him alone. Go put that $10 in the plate. Go put that $10. Go put, I mean, just hounding him. Finally, Levi gets up from his seat. He he goes down to the front. He pulls his little wallet out. He's going to put that $10 in the plate. He opens his billfold. The billfold is empty. He totally forgot that he put the $10 in the car before he came in. In that moment, he heard God say this. I don't need your money. I need your yes. I'm not looking for you. God doesn't need our money, church. He needs your yes. He needs your obedience. And that's what I want to challenge every person in this room this morning. Give God your yes. Well, what does that mean? That means before he ever asks you to do anything, you've already made up your mind. The answer is yes. What am I saying yes to? That seems a little scary. Yeah, it's really scary. It's incredibly dangerous. It is. But it is the most rewarding, exciting journey that you could ever embark on in your life to give Jesus your yes. I need you to go there. Yes. I need you to say this. Yep. Yeah. I need you to serve in kids' ministry. Absolutely. I already gave you my yes. Whatever it is, give God your yes. Surrender to him. Say yes to him. Let your response this morning be, God, I am yours. Here am I. Send me. Send me. I want to challenge you this week before your feet hit the floor every single morning. I want you to pray, God, search my heart. Reveal any fear. Uncover any sin. God, I want you to lead me. And as you begin to show me these things and reveal these things and uncover these things, God, I want you to break those in my life. God, anything that's not of you, I don't want it. There's nothing worth keeping. If it keeps me away from you, God, break those things in my life. And then I want you to pray, God, today, if you're looking for somebody to use, use me. Use me. God, God, send we instantly think that God's going to tell us to sell everything, sell everything, empty our bank accounts, fly to Africa. Like, I don't think that's what God's asking you to do today. Maybe in the days to come, some of you will take those kinds of steps of faith. 
I don't think God's nearly as concerned about you crossing an ocean as he is concerned about you crossing the street. I think where God really wants to send you is to the next cubicle. Yeah, to the next classroom, to the person across the streets, to the person across the warehouse. I think that's where God really wants to send you. And if you give him your yes, you have no idea what God can use. Your very broken, your very flawed existence, he can take something so ordinary and do extraordinary things with it. Amen. Bow your heads this morning if you would. God, I just pray that you would give us the boldness this morning, the courage, the bravery to say, God, here I am. Send me. God, let that be our dangerous prayer today. Wherever you want us to go, whatever you want us to do, God, send me. God, I'm available. I'm available. God, as you do that and as we're obedient and as we give you our yes, I just can't imagine what you're going to do. I can't imagine the lives are going to be touched and changed. Before we close today, I want to ask you this question. We're, we're talking about giving our yeses. To, to be obedient and surrender, but maybe you're here this morning and you've never even given that initial yes to Jesus, I need you to be my savior. Jesus, I need you to come live inside of me. Jesus, I need to surrender this life to you so you can wash away this sin, so you can wash away these mistakes, so you can give me a future and a hope. And I just wanna ask if there's anybody here this morning, no one's gonna embarrass you or call you down or do anything weird, I promise. But if you're here this morning, you would say, Pastor Mark, I don't know that I have Jesus living in my heart. I don't know that I, that I am where I need to be with the Lord. If my life was to end today, I really don't know where I would spend eternity. But Pastor Mark, today I want to say yes to Jesus. I want to ask him to be my Lord and my Savior. With nobody looking around right now, would you just lift your hand if that's you? I, I want to say yes to Jesus. I see those hands and those hands and those hands. Come on, somebody else. I, I want to say yes to Jesus. Praise God. Hands going up all over the room this morning. King's House, would you just grab the hand of the person next to you? I don't want anybody praying alone. Listen, if this is your first time praying this prayer, it's not a magic prayer, but it is your heart saying yes to Jesus. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the incredible promise we have. So all across this room, just repeat this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I need you to be my savior. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on a cross. I believe you rose from the dead. And I believe you are the only way to heaven. From this day forward, my whole life belongs to you. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Can we give God some praise this morning, church? God is so good. Hey, Lee, will you put that slide up there for me? I think it's still on there. It's all blue. Yeah. Listen, if you said yes to Jesus today for the very first time, take one more step. Don't just walk out of here, okay? Take one more step. I want you to text, I said yes, all one word, I said yes, to the number 97000. Because I just want to be able to get a hold of you tomorrow and encourage you and make sure you got a Bible and make sure you're equipped to embark on this incredible journey. Amen. Do it for me, guys. I said yes, 97000. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we're having prayer right here in this room. Don't forget next Sunday, man, it's going to be a special one. Invite a friend. Don't you dare miss it. I love you, King's House. Have a great holiday. God bless you guys.